Uh, my name is Jeremy Johnson. I work for Matrix New World Engineering, and I am the co-chair of the Natural Resources Work Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Glenn Bittner, the other co-chair of the Natural Resources Work Group, will be moderating the chat uh, window, and we'll be uh, asking your questions at the end. So please post any questions for any of the presenters in the chat window during their presentation. Our first presenter here will be Drew Decker. Drew is the National Map Liaison for Arizona and works for the National Geospatial Program with, within USGS. He works with local, state, and other federal agencies to coordinate mapping, production, maintenance, standards, and planning in support of the national map. He also provides support to USGS scientists and the public for mapping-related assistance concerning geographic data. Take it away, Drew. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I will work to share my screen, share. Hope you can see that. And now I'm going to go into presentation mode. And you should be able to see my uh, my screen here. Okay, so thank everyone. I'm Drew Decker with U.S. Geological Survey, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, enhancements to the National Geography or Hydrography data set. Okay. I've also uploaded this so that it would be available um, in the records uh, later on. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the, the data sets that we have that serve uh, national hydrography needs for the for the country. And there, there are three of them here. But before we get into that, I want to point out that uh, we had a study a few years ago called the HRBS, Hydrography Requirements and Benefits Study. And that looked at the need for hydro data. Who would use it? How would it be applied? What uh, agencies and organizations would utilize the data? And uh, you can see here a number of um, different applications, such as ecological flows, drought, flooding, as, as you would expect to have. And, and it also provided information on benefits. So what benefits would people uh, gain from having data like this? And so this is kind of helping us establish and uh, or re-solidify the foundation for the need of these different data sets. Okay, so we have a, we support a lot of diverse uses as I just showed in the last slide. Uh, the data are easily accessible. Folks can download these from several different sites that we have. Uh, we have map services too, so you can bring the data into your GIS software and view it with other data. It's on the cloud as well, uh, as part of uh, Amazon uh, cloud services, I believe. Uh, you can see in the bottom set of bullets a number of uses again, aside from the, the hydro uses. It, it serves in the cartography, uh, web applications, et cetera. So there's many different uses for the data that we have. So the three data sets that we support are the NHD, National Hydrography Data Set, so this is a drainage network of features such as rivers, streams, canals, lakes and ponds, uh, stream gauges, and a lot more. We also have the watershed boundary data set. That's a hierarchical uh, collection of nested drainage basins. Uh, very important because we also distribute our data by the basin, typically, because the different basin sizes, you download the basin outline, and you get all the hydro data that goes with it. And then we have something called NHD plus high resolution. That's simply a copy of the NHD, but greatly enhanced to include elevation data, um, as well as a number of value added attributes, often tied to different flow information, as well as uh, navigation and different uh, stream characteristics. So NHD is the one we'll talk about the most here. It's the one where we have an active stewardship program, which I'll mention in a few minutes. And so we have a lot of updates to this. Continuously updated, you can see the second bullet here. And this little graphic shows typically what's in NHD. It looks like a lot of the things you probably have seen on the topo maps, okay? Surface water, such as lakes and streams. Um, we have uh, other types of point features, I'm not showing them here, but springs, for example, certain wells, uh, dams are, are included as well. This little area shows in the lake here, the red line to an artificial path. So we're connecting all the waterways above and below the lake so that we have uh, connectivity. It really serves as a network. You can see here, uh, it's a 24,000 scale 
um, data, if, if not better, and it's available, again, in several different uh, formats. So looking at some of the components here, we have a few attributes in here. It's not heavily attributed, but there are a few basic ones. We have name, so there's a name of the, the uh, waterway, for example. We also have the classification, which is a big deal. Is the water uh, ephemeral? Is it intermittent? Is it perennial? Okay, so that's something we store in there and we can update that as part of the stewardship uh, process too. Uh, flow direction, so we have a flow direction as well, uh, which is key to navigation, which leads to, again, you can, you can now look from this little green box here, you can look downstream, you can look upstream, so you can route on this. So it's a lot like a transportation data set in some ways in that you have a connected network you can navigate whichever direction you choose to go, you know, up and downstream and through the whole network, just like you can with, with a road data set. So we also have some, some further um, data that will help with this. Each of the lines here, the, the flow lines, has a reach code. I believe that has its origins and early EPA work with NHD, NHD plus, in that this is the 14-digit code tied to both the um, the hydrologic unit as well as kind of a random number after that, um, 14 digits long. You can see here each, each reach code will have a way to to have a speed address in a way by looking at the percentage of the uh, of the length of the actual reach and where your point location is. You could click along this one, 1401, 0002, et cetera and see where you are in terms of the percentage of the length of the reach. So it has some ties similar to a street address then, right? Showing you the, the relative location, in this case, well, the exact location along the, um, the waterway. So putting this all together here, because you can navigate on this, you have contact. So we have a stream gauge, for example, with information. You can tie that. It's actually a feature in NHD which has a lot of information, as you could imagine, for the active gauges, that you kind of put things together. You can see where it is, you see what's upstream of it, you see what's downstream, you see the names, you see the dam, you see divergences, convergences, et cetera. So it gives you kind of a, a complete picture of the hydro network. So the watershed boundary data set, won't spend too much time there, but uh, again, this is the nested hierarchical network of watersheds. You can see in the larger map at the top of the little graphic, um, Arizona is actually in uh, region 15, and you can subdivide it from there. Lower Colorado, for example, the name of the uh, of 15, um, and then you can subdivide it by the, the different basins within. So we have right now uh, six different levels, beginning with the two-digit code 15, and you can you can build on that. Um, 1502, 1502, 03, et cetera, and have finer and finer watersheds. Again, we make our data available by the watershed, so they they work hand in hand. And you see uh, plus high resolution. Um, this is built on as a copy of the 1 to 24,000 scale NHD, where we then add in the elevation. We burn the data, you might say, into the elevation so they are working together um, as well as developing little catchments, which is like a very small watershed for each stream segment. So we were working now to get this out for the country. I think it's just about done for the continental U.S., the beta version's out. And so periodically, I don't know how long that will be, but periodically we'll be making an update to the, um, to the NHD+. Plus. And so all three data sets now are available um, for download. A few enhancements that we have that are tied to NHD. Um, you can see here we have something called the visibility filter now, which allows you to, it's an attribute that's included, allows you to filter out data because there's an awful lot of it. Uh, you're able to fil filter it out by the scale you prefer to view the data at. Okay, you can see the little image in the center here as uh, different screens are turned off at different uh, viewing scales. We have um, 
hydro addressing tools, this is going to be a big deal because NHD, again, is a network. And you have addressing, you have locations and flow on it. So now you can tie other data to that. If an agency were interested in a spot where there was, a, say, a fish kill along a river, or are there uh, certain properties alongside a, a river or lake that you want to tie to the network, data that you may have, how do you relate it to the hydro network? The same way you relate data on different things and locations to the street network. Okay, so we have tools that we're working on here uh, to help you take your own data at your own organization and tie it into our network. Uh, one little example here is kind of interesting. The IC Water Critique, Incident Command Water, I believe is the tool name. Uh, you may remember the Gold King Mine spill a few years ago, and you've had the NHD data available, but by tying in other information, in this case, velocity, the screen flow, you get an idea of how long it will take for uh, the spill, for example, to work its way downstream and ultimately into Lake Powell. You can see it takes eight days and you get an idea of how it's, how the water is moving and it's progressing where the spill is. So this is a good example of taking other outside data and relating it to NHD. So, so kind of where are we going in the future? We're looking at um, data we've had for a while, the old one to, one to 100,000 scale NHD plus, which is built on, a, on really a 30 meter BEM. We're working now on a a kind of a 10 meter DEM level. And also beginning to look at uh, hydro derived from LIDAR, which might give you block level or street level forecasting too, more on a one meter DEM, which is uh, coming down the road a ways. So looking at stewardship, um, we do have a program where stewards help us uh, maintain the data, stewards or other organizations outside USGS, or sometimes even groups within our agency, actually. But they take responsibility for helping us map and update data for certain regions. It could be the whole state, it could be lands owned by a certain organization, it could be county or city, whatever makes sense. And they help us uh, maintain the data because they have on the ground knowledge and familiarity with the data and the uh, conditions, the weather conditions, for example. That helps a lot with updating the features, updating the screen classifications. And um, we've had a number of states participate in this. And I know uh, that the Atrix Natural Resources Working Group were, were discussing a bit on how to uh, look at the best hydro solution for the state of Arizona, where NHD may be able to play some role in that. Stewardship model, uh, the number of states that are involved with stewardship uh, to, to different degrees. You can see here a few examples where we've had uh, groups that maybe a city in New York, a couple of agencies, one in Alabama and California here where I am, you have the California Department of Water Resources who's a steward. You have some federal agencies too uh, jumping in where it makes sense for their needs as well. Uh, part of the community communications with our stewards through the hydro data community with all sorts of information on activities and software and tools and phone calls and discussions um, that kind of bring the stewardship community together. We have a number of editing tools and utilities. We have training on a number of these and I believe that the working group here may have a few folks interested in the NHC update training, third bullet down there, which will resume again in November. And I do need to get the dates on that uh, for everybody. Um, but you can see here, there are a number of tools that we have available for different functions in NHC. Uh, we have a, a hydro maintenance portal where people can go to check out data. People check it out by the hydrologic unit, usually a, say a eight digit watershed, which may be a say a thousand square miles or so, check that out, do some work on it, and it gets checked back in. Uh, we have another uh, tool out there, which is more for the user community. Uh, these are basic markups where people can say, hey, I, I'm clicking on an area, I think something needs to be changed here, they can mark it up in effect with, without having to check anything out, without having to uh, be a steward, just for users to be able to go through here and and, and find issues. 
And then it comes to us and our stewards to help uh, look at this. We have a little reviewer package here uh, that allows uh, trained NEC WBD partners, such as stewards too, and USGS folks to um, review these uh, suggestions and uh, put them into effect. So where we are in Arizona right now, one thing we're looking at is a uh, possible pilot project to examine and review some of the NHD for two um, hydrologic units in Southern Arizona. Some of the steps here are uh, collecting other local and state data to see how it may work to uh, improve uh, NHG or vice versa, how will they work together? Uh, the second bullet there is to look at the uh, NHG uh, edit training, which will, which is monthly and we starting again in November, and then kind of consider the best solution for the state. What makes sense for Arizona and its needs? So this is just a quick look here. The, the brown lines, by the way, are ephemeral streams. Uh, the light blues are intermittent. Dark blues are uh, perennial. I can see there'll be some editing needed here, uh, but to get an idea of kind of what you're, what we're starting with, um, with NHD. So this will be, it's gonna be very interesting to look at these uh, watersheds and see uh, how they may be edited by the, uh, by the working group. And then finally, a little contact map for liaisons. I cover Arizona, but there are people like me all over the country that work to support cooperative base mapping, such as hydro and elevation too. So, um, so this little contact map here for, for getting a hold of us. If there are any folks here who are, are outside of Arizona, uh, this will help with that. And I believe I'm just about done here. So, any um, any questions? Great, thanks, Drew. Appreciate that. Uh... Glenn, is there any questions in the window? I'm not seeing anything in the chat box at this point. Okay. If anyone has a question for Drew, go ahead and put it in there and we'll pass it along. Not. Something comes up later, okay. Drew, we'll make sure you get yeah. it. Yep. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'll be around uh, tomorrow too. And yeah, I'd be happy to help with any questions. As always, thanks, Drew. Appreciate it. Uh, You're welcome. Hearing. So now we will move to Patty and Cody. Um, second, where is Patty? I fault here. Patty, 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 Patty. Patty, are you hearing us? I oh. am with you. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> Technical difficulties. That's always fun, right? I'll get you. I'll take yeah. you. I'll call the uh, phone. That's why yeah. I don't see my name. Yeah. Uh, um, we are going to be hearing from uh, Patty Spindler and Cody Maynard right now talking about the WOTUS project. Uh, starting off with Patty. Patty is a senior scientist and aquatic ecologist in the water quality division at the at ADEQ. She has worked on stream water quality monitoring, bio criteria, and sediment standards development, and WOTUS issues for ADE for the past 30 years. So, Patty, it's all yours. Great. Can you see my screen then? Okay. I'll assume that's a yes. Oh, uh, no, 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 we don't see it one yet. Yeah, one second. Hang on. Hang on. I don't have anybody else. I have you as presenter, but we're not seeing it. Okay, hold on. Um, sure. I guess it's trying to connect. There we go. Okay. One second, starting right now. One second. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Super. All right, well, hello everyone. I'm glad to be here to talk about the importance of GIS to Arizona's water quality management programs. I'll be providing a quick overview of the new EPA navigable waters protection rule, um, potential risk to Arizona waters, and DEQ's efforts to develop a new surface water protection program um, for the state of Arizona. Uh, we already did my introduction. 
So um, I'll be giving you a, an overview of the navigable waters protection rule established just this June of 2020. Uh, the current state of protection uh, for uh, Arizona water bodies uh, under the Clean Water Act um, and uh, the opportunity for developing a state of Arizona water quality program. Um, my talk is not really a GIS talk, but it provides some context for my colleague Cody's GIS talk uh, regarding improving Arizona's hydrography or our flow regime map, which is really the essential tool for determining which waters are jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. So it's a critical component for us. I wanted to give you a little bit of history on the Clean Water Act. It was established in 1972 and defined uh, which waters were jurisdictional or waters of the U.S. or WOTUS, um, which was later redefined in 1986. Um, DEQ was established as the state's environmental agency to implement the Clean Water Act in 1987. And, uh, most of our standards were established in rule in 1992 and basically identified which waters and designated uses uh, and numeric and narrative standards were applicable to waters of the U.S. Um, in 1999, uh, the legislature uh, gave some statutory authority for developing water quality standards and, and a few other pieces, but not really a comprehensive water quality program. Um, in 2002, Arizona received primacy on, uh, from EPA on issuing point source discharge elimination uh, permit. And then in 2015, you may have heard of the clean water rule, EPA redefined uh, waters of the U.S. with uh, a, a more expanded scope um, uh, than, than in the 1986. Uh, there was a lot of backlash to that, and in kind of in reaction, uh, the navigable waters rule uh, shrunk the scope of, of waters that would be subject to the Clean Water Act pretty substantially. Um, as I said, published just uh, in June of this year. Um, there are 12 lawsuits uh, ongoing to um, repeal or revise the um, navigable waters rule. Um, there haven't been any significant actions, but those are all working their way through the courts. So the future is unclear for this, this rule and, and the current scope. Um, but DEQ is now forced to respond to the revised scope of Clean Water Act jurisdiction and must really determine for the first time which waters are WOTUS or not um, because it has uh, permit uh, implications, impaired water implications, et cetera. So this is a pictogram, pictograph that uh, shows uh, pictorially what, what is uh, considered jurisdictional or not uh, under this new rule. Um, there's four jurisdictional categories that are meant to reflect what are relatively permanent waters. So there's traditional navigable waters, uh, which would be like the Colorado River. There are um, the, tri the tributaries like uh, R8, major rivers, the Salt, Verde, et cetera, uh, lakes, ponds, and impoundments that are that lie within jurisdictional tributaries, uh, and wetlands that are adjacent to uh, rivers, adjacent and, and touching the rivers. Um, but there are also uh, 12 excluded categories, which uh, uh, ephemeral streams are in that category. Um, isolated wetlands, isolated ponds, um, most ditches, prior converted cropland, uh, and ground are, are examples there. Um, in addition, uh, lakes, ponds, and wetlands that are tribed to a terminal basin, such as Wilcox Playa, would not be jurisdictional. Um, in the rule, there is a provision that uh, ephemeral breaks or reaches uh, along a river that um, may not necessarily sever jurisdiction uh, of upstream uh, perennial or intermittent water bodies as long as flow is conveyed in a typical year. 
And typical year has a very specific meaning and requires additional analysis of precipitation data to ensure that evidence of flow events occur during normal or typical weather conditions. And um, so this has turned out to be uh, a large wrinkle in these jurisdiction uh, analyses because we need to know both the flow conditions and then uh, precipitation data to go with it. Um, the preamble to the Navajo Waters Protection Rule uh, provides more information as do fact sheets on EPA's website uh, to provide additional guidance on the revised scope and how to conduct jurisdictional uh, determination. Um, at ADEQ, because we are trying to figure this out, um, what is jurisdictional or not, uh, we've developed a uh, Navigable Waters Protection Rule Screening Toolkit um, initially for our permittees to help them evaluate whether their waters definitively are not or are jurisdictional or if they fall into a maybe category to provide some tools to have them assess the risk or the potential uh, for them to, uh, that their water is jurisdictional and that they may need a permit. And the types of tools um, in this red path, um, the USGS raindrop tool or flow path raindrop tool uh, is used. Um, and the second one uses primarily our flow regime map. And then in the yellow path, uh, we have some tools such as percent riparian corridor within the reach. Um, yeah, if it's greater than 50%, uh, it uh, indicates potential intermittency. We have a snowpack snow elevation and a depth to groundwater tool as well to help use a weight of evidence approach to uh, determine flow regime where it's not known. Um, so, um, so we have some tools in place to provide a screening level evaluation, but it is not at this point a, a, a true jurisdictional determination that will happen at a later time. Um, and using some of the tools EPA hasn't fully rolled out yet, such as the stream flow duration assessment method, which is a, a field survey approach to identifying flow regime and the um, uh, antecedent precipitation tool um, to conduct that typical year analysis. So while we don't have estimates of what percent of water bodies are not jurisdictional at this time, uh, we do know that there are some lakes perennial and intermittent streams that will not be protected under this new rule, such as urban constructed lakes um, are an example of isolated waters, uh, rivers and lakes that are tributary to a terminal basin, such as Lake Cochise and Wilcox Playa, uh, lakes that lie within an ephemeral channel, that's an ephemeral break that um, does not pass the typical year test. Um, and then other natural rural isolated lakes like Pito Petito Pond would not be jurisdictional um, under the new rule. In terms of current water quality protections that the EQ has, um, uh, we uh, currently under the Clean Water Act, we have uh, this kind of this top line of protection for waters of the U.S. So that includes, you know, point source discharge permits, the ability to set standards, enforce those standards, conduct loading studies, um, uh, dredge and fill permits, which are covered by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, but we do the 401 certification for those, and then to uh, issue non-point source grants to restore stream water quality. Um, those are all current Clean Water Act programs. At the state level, really, we have limited statutory authority to set water quality standards and enforce those standards, but we don't have permitting authority or any of these other um, uh, programs. Um, 
to take a closer look at other programs and authorities that you have. Um, the Aquifer Protection Permit Program, uh, really designed for a protection of groundwater um, from discharging facilities like wastewater treatment plants to protect groundwater for drinking water purposes. Um, DEQ has some nuisance authority that prescribes minimum standards to prevent uh, or abate environmental nuisances. Um, we do have the ability to set standards, but we have not done so at the state level. Um, and same for the uh, enforcement of those standards. ADQ also has authority to regulate solid waste facilities um, as well. Even with these statutory elements, it still falls short of a comprehensive program for water quality control uh, and especially uh, state discharge permit. So next steps, <laughs> in order to fill the gap for water quality control and protection for state waters that are not WOTUS, we need a few key things. We need better flow regime maps to enable WOTUS evaluation of all waters of the state and to help us determine the scope of which waters and designated uses will be protected uh, in a state level program. Um, and we'll need additional statutory authority and rules for state level, you know, standards, monitoring, assessment, and discharge permits, um, all that would be part of a um, comprehensive state program. Um, we're in the process of putting together an outline um, and proposal to the legislature, um, but um, uh, we're still at the early stages. All right, thanks, Patty. Yeah. Um, let's, let's, okay, let, uh, let's go on to Cody. Um, I'll make you present shortly. Uh, we'll hold uh, questions for both uh, you and Cody here till the end here, Patty. Okay, I was just going to make my last statement if you don't oh, mind. Oh, sure. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to cut you off quickly, but that's fine. Pause for a moment, but mm -hmm. uh, just, um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, you know, um, we're heavily dependent on having accurate flow regime maps to do these WOTUS evaluations. And so, um, you know, Cody's gonna talk more about that, but all the hydrography work that, you know, you all are doing is is really essential and important work to us. So um, for more information about the navigable waters rule or um, the ADQ efforts, to develop our own state program, um, you can uh, email this address or find more information on our website. So, thank you. Great, okay. thanks again, Patty. All right, Cody, I'm gonna make you presenter. All right, we're gonna hear from Cody Maynard. Cody is an environmental scientist at uh, and GIS analyst with over five years of experience in water quality, watershed remediation, and GIS application. Two and a half years with the state of Arizona. Cody has been very active in agency database management and map publication. Cody has a large range of industry experience in cartographic principles and design, UAV imagery collection, spatial analysis, and web mapping. Cody also has experience in developing and editing technical reports, web content, and improving workflows through standard documentation. Cody holds a certificate in trade of trade and engineering and a BSc in environmental science and policy and is currently working toward completion of his MAS and GIS. So here's Cody. All right, can we hear and see my screen? Yes. All right, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for spending your day with us. Um, so now we're gonna talk about flow regimes, our criteria and methods uh, for our mapping purposes. Um, over the last year and a half, Flow regimes have become a very popular topic, as you can see by Patty's presentation. Um, it's become a very challenging effort, and I, at this point, it doesn't get the credit that it technically deserves. What we've done over at DEQ is devise a way of integrating this into our GIS mapping and provide a means for flexible data analysis across all various principles. So, to start off for, with a couple definitions for flow regimes, uh, per the Arizona Administrative Code, we have three different types of, of flow regime, technically. 
We have perennial waters, which are surface waters that flow continuously throughout the year. We have intermittent waters, which are streams of, or reaches that flow continuously, but for only certain times of the year when it receives water from springs or other surface sources, such as snowpack melt um, from storm sources. And then we have ephemeral waters, which means that it's a surface water that has a channel that is technically above the water table and flows only in direct response to precipitation. Uh, usually in Arizona, that's the case with any kind of monsoon rain we get. Now, once you dug, dig into the subject, you start to realize that the questions start to outnumber the, the possible options and answers. Especially in Arizona, we've spent more time over the years mapping and observing where water is and not so much where it isn't. With the new clean water ruling, the waters of the U.S., this is even more important. So we have run into certain questions first specifically. Do we look at the stream or do we look at the reach? Where is the breaking between? breaking point between seasonal flows and flows in direct responses to precipitation? How does one practically evaluate whether a channel is at all times above the water table, especially in Arizona with moving sediment? Perennial flows, what type of uh, percentage are we gonna go with, whether it's 99%, 95%, daily mean flows, instantaneous flows? The variables are endless. Regarding this, does flow regulation change a flow regime determination, specifically the Colorado River, for instance? Uh, we run into issues with spatial intermissivity, for example, with San Pedro. And then what about cases where there is no data for, for instance, a, la a large part of the state outside of uh, city boundaries? So things to remember, flow regimes can change over time. Most maps don't. And at various source elevations of flow regimes, many yield different results. So a dynamic and adaptable final product is needed to cover all bases. So as the previous questions indicate, flow regime turnization is a matter of intelligence threshold setting, informed interpretation, and consistent methodology across the board. At DEQ, we have three major types of evaluation. We have field and on-site methods, which is boots on the ground where we're actually on-site taking a look. And then we have database methods, which are empirical, which is where we're looking at past data sources. We have models where we're predicting and, pre and working with projections to extrapolate. And then we have GIS and imagery-based methods. Previously, these were all lumped together, multiple types of, comp of, of data competing for superiority. There was no priorities, no provisions. Perennials trumped all other data. And then this was the issue with the previous approach. Multiple types of evaluations were lumped. No provisions were made to distinguish between multiple rec records across multiple different data sets. If a per perennial designation applied to one record segment, that segment showed as perennial in any other record, show no flow, or was it suggest intermittency. So we do run into issues between there is gapping in the data sets. And that there was previous stuff was premised on a one-to-one -one relationship assumption where one-to-many one cardinality was more of an accurate depiction. So what we did is uh, we split our attribute table, our, our table and our designations into observations and then line work. So this, this new approach was splitting. We worked with designations, which consisted of the perennial intermittent and, and ephemeral flow regimes. And then these designations determined by full consideration and were prioritized of all the observations for the water body IDs. These observations consisted of mostly reconnaissance information, model results, and other ancillary information along the way. Um, there's multiple observations are possible for any given location, whether it's different sites on different reaches, you're looking at a smaller segment, or at a grander scale, you're looking at the entire reach. Observations are also used to inform the designations, so looking at our designated uses and such. Wet dry mapping is a form of the observation by itself as well. It's not synonymous with flow regime de designation, but it does give us a good understanding of where the water is on the reach and it allows us to depict a better understanding of that reach. So it's hard to envision how flow regimes could be assigned without some unit of aggregation. The key points to remember for what we have done is, is that at DEQ's algorithm, the unit of aggregation is the water body IDs, which is the actual individual identification, identified reaches of the water body. Arizona defines this as the assessment units for our Clean Water Act purposes. 
It's also possible to use other units of aggregation, whether you want to use the NHD reach codes or any of the any, any other linkage attributes. But some set cap scaffolding is needed in order to assign flow regimes, and this is required. So the new approach. So designations comprise uh, the route, which in this case is the stream. We have the name, the route ID from uh, from measure to measure, so from where it originates to where it terminates its water body ID, and its flow regime designation. Observations are comprised of all other supporting fields in the attribute table, what other information you want to attach, whether it's notes or other documentation relating to the actual physical water body. The water body ID is used to relate the two tables to each other, where they relate a single record is one in one table is joined with several records in another table sharing the related fields. So for this, for for this purpose, if we have multiple observations for one water body ID, it can take in all possible considerations for that water body ID. So this is just a quick overview of, of a one-to-many relationship. For in the, you can see in this example, it's taking the employees and it's putting them to the proper allocation ID. So we only have four employees, but we're allowed to put it to multiple attributes within our table. So the observation types. So within our table, we have different observation types, as and these are defined as subtypes. And we have defined the following: we have wet dry mapping, site visits, historical information, model predictions, GIS imagery, macro invertebrate indicators, flow duration series, uh, a newer feature which is the Arizona Water Watch app, which is more of a volunteer program where we're collecting data from, and then we have other. So the general rule of thumb with these is that. We have empirical data is greater, is, is more robust over model data. Field visits are more robust to remote assessments. Uh, duration of record are more robust and are more are, are, are stronger in case to instantaneous observations. Each type has a priority assigned to it. And then following the types of observation, we have scopes, which these ultimately get funneled down into. So scopes come in several different factors. Um, we have defined it as the following. We have reach-based observations, we have segment-based observations, and then we have dynamic segment-based operations, which is where the category of wet dry mapping over multiple years fits in, and we have point-based observations. The scopes govern how multiple observations can be reconciled and ultimately bins all these observations accordingly. So kind of in just a larger overview, you can see that we have the type of description, we have its abbreviation, its priority, and then some of these are set accordingly to whether they are a segment point reach or dynamic segment, but variety of the, of the observation types can be accommodated to fit whatever needs to be implemented over the years. So as new data or new sources of methodology for collecting these observations can be included over time. And they, these can be defined as domains as we go. So I won't super dig into the actual flow regime algorithm just because it's a little wordy and it's a little cumbersome. But the takeaways from this are that the observations are sorted first by priority, secondarily considered by the scope, and for the same priority items, several running sums by flow regime are tracked to look at the, the various amounts of each particular flow regime sum. Majority length regime controls and it, this may include undetermined if the model cannot accurately depict the flow regime for the reach where some evidence is not more weighted against another. So some final thoughts on this is that the time duration element is paramount and is very important in flow regime determination. Most evaluations are static over a single point of time. We need to be able to accommodate for that accordingly and then Followed for the extra update in the NHD is that these models need to be able to take into account qualitative and quantitative data and work in a way that they can be all be accounted for correctly and accordingly and weight them accordingly. And yet, qualitative information may be all that we have in some cases. In the absence of quantitative info, we are compelled to use the best possible information that we have, even though it might be less ideal. Although we strive to obtain and promote quantitative info as the ideal basis for flow regime determinations for all streamer segments, quantitative info is modeled not empirically. There should be ground truthing to confirm those accuracies 
of the prior analysis. So to summarize this with what Patty has said and where we are going with our flow regime determinations, at the end of the day, data is what makes the machine run. So at the end of the day, WOTUS rulings have increased in our need for data. We are currently at the agency level working with AGIC to collect data and create an authoritative data set. So if you, anyone out there knows of data sets that may be of use to the state or to the pilot studies that we are doing, please feel free to reach out. Um, but that is everything. If you have any questions, please feel to reach out to me as needed. Great, thanks, Cody, appreciate that. Um, were there any questions in the chat at all, Ben? Nope, there's nothing in there. You guys are making it easy for me. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to our last presenters then. Um, we we're going to be hearing from David Saavedra and Louis Cadell from the Chesapeake Conservancy. Um, I'll introduce David first. Uh, David is a member of the geospatial team at Chesapeake Conservancy, whose work focuses on hyper-resolution, stream mapping, and terrain analysis. Prior to joining Chesapeake Conservancy, David worked for the USGS Eastern Geographic Science Center, mapping headwater streams using LIDAR and modeling sediment fluxes throughout the Bay watershed. <clears throat> David holds a bachelor's in environmental science from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and has a background in hydrology and geospatial analysis. A native of Southern Maryland, David enjoys fishing, brewing beer, and spending time outdoors. Um, and David, do you want to introduce Lewis and I'll make you a presenter? Sure. Um... See if I can do justice here. <laughs> so Lewis has been at the Chesapeake Conservancy's Conservation Innovation Center. Um, that's a special team. He's been with us for about five years. Um, he's got a background in remote sensing and land cover production. Um, he holds his bachelor's and his master's degree from the University of Maryland um, College Park. And currently, he serves as a program manager on our team. Um, overseeing our work in the West. So maybe you're wondering why is the Chesapeake group here today? Um, we've got a partnership with the Lincoln Institute's Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy. Um, and so Lewis is involved in managing that partnership. And looks like I can share now. So I guess we can see everything and still hear. Yep, we can see. All right. Um, so that uh, Lewis is actually going to start us off. So I will let him take over. All right. Thanks, David. Um, thanks for the intro. I guess in the interest of time, I'll try to be quick here. Um, I guess we'll go to the next slide. So. As a general overview, we'll kind of give some background info as to who we are, you know, the research we're doing out in the Chesapeake and why we're in Arizona, um, and then introduce some novel new methods that we kind of want to share with everyone and look at in terms of how we can enhance a lot of the great work that's going on in Arizona. Um, and then introduce, uh, a pilot that we're actually planning on starting up. All right, next slide. Uh, so the Conservation Innovation Center is essentially a department of the Conservancy. Um, our focus is pretty much on research and development of high resolution data, both for land cover, land use, and hydrography. Um, we do work outside the watershed largely in partnership with the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy. Essentially, we're trying to take a lot of our lessons learned in the Chesapeake and see how they apply in arid and semi-arid landscapes out west. And the focus is really on precision conservation and fine scale analyses. And so we would kind of like to have um, and introduce a conversation as to how this data might fit into existing workflows. Next slide. And I'll pass back to David. Great, thank you. So uh, as Lewis mentioned, um, we've got some research on novel methods for developing um, improved hydrography in the Chesapeake. 
So we're calling this hyper-resolution hydrography. Um, and there's sort of two parts to it. Uh, we received a grant from the Chesapeake Bay Trust to develop this novel approach. Um, and that was done in collaboration with Dr. Matthew Baker at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And as part of that grant, uh, we did an extensive literature review on um, sort of the theory of hydrography and current um, state-of-the-art methods for mapping hydrography. Um, I did a, a field validation. I visited 14 different watersheds uh, throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, noted how streams formed and how they behaved, and we provided an extensive comparison of mapping methods, um, including the method that we were proposing and developing. Um, and we submitted a report summarizing these findings. And then in the second phase, um, we were awarded a six-year cooperative agreement from the Chesapeake Bay Program Office, um, which is under the EPA, to actually implement these methods that we had developed before. Um, so we're automating and parallelizing these methods and implementing them over the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, which you can see on the screen here. So a key component of our methods is that they um, are universal and can be applied broadly at scale um, without the need to do a lot of local fine tuning. Um, we're currently developing a manuscript for publication. So some background on the approach. Um, if anyone has mapped streams before in a GIS environment, um, you know that typically it involves a DEM, a digital elevation model, and you do some manipulation to that model so that it can uh, drain, water can flow across it. And then you'd usually calculate flow directions and flow accumulation. Um, but we take a different approach. So we delineate uh, stream and channel-like features based on the geomorphometric signature and the terrain, and not based on thresholds of these predictive layers. And the algorithm we use to do this uh, is called geomorphons. You can see a diagram of it here at the bottom. Um, we did not develop this algorithm. It was developed by Jastavik in 2013. Um, but the way the algorithm works, it's a computer vision algorithm. So for every pixel on the landscape, it analyzes the line of sight along eight different directions outward from the pixel. And along those eight lines of sight, it assesses um, whether the line of sight is interrupted by a higher, equal, or lower elevation on the landscape. And based on the number of higher, lower, and equal elevations and their arrangement around that center pixel, it categorizes them into one of 10 constituent landforms, which you can see on the right side of the screen. Um, so just to sort of conceptualize that, we have these nice little diagrams on the left. Um, so a flat is easy to conceptualize. Um, in all eight directions, the elevations are equal to the elevation of the focal pixel in the middle. Um, and then a peak is also easy to conceptualize. In all eight directions, the terrain is lower, um, and so on. But for hydrography mapping, we're particularly interested in valleys, which are shown in blue, and pits, which are shown in black. So with valleys, um, the higher pixels are on the sides of the focal pixel. And then on either end, uh, we would typically see either equal or lower elevations, um, which you can see. I'll give an example next. So to see how this all sort of works um, and how we bring this together to pull streams out of the landscape, I'll walk you through this in an animation. So to start, we have aerial imagery. Um, this is outside of Tucson. You can see a few washes through here. Uh, the vegetation's denser by the washes. Um, and so the first step is we start with a LIDAR DEM, which you can see a shaded relief image here. And in this, you can see in those same locations where the vegetation is denser and you can see the wash. Um, now they're really apparent. With your eyes, you can really pick out where these, these incisions are that are the, the channel. So we run this classification uh, first at a coarse scale using a broad search radius and a 10 meter DEM. And you can see here that the blue pixels correspond with the general area where those channels uh, and washes were located. 
And then we run this classification again at a fine scale using the LiDAR DVM. Um, and now you can see that the blue areas really correspond exactly with where those channels were located. So to isolate those channels, um, because you can see lots of other stuff on here that are not channels, uh, we take and extract a valley network from a combination of the coarse and fine scale classifications that we've done. And you can see that here in blue. And we use this as sort of a, a filter to isolate the channel features from the fine scale classification, which you can see in green. Um, and a key thing to note about these channel features is that um, this, this is a raster, so these are two dimensional as opposed to a, a line, which would just be one dimensional. So they show the channels uh, from bank to bank, and they have a, a width aspect to them, which is really important. And another thing to note is that they are discontinuous. So um, in real life, channels are not always continuous. Sometimes they, they fan out and just disappear and then reconvene further down slope. Um, sometimes they're interrupted by culverts or roads. So this, this layer has discontinuities, which is useful for a lot of contexts. Um, but for other contexts, it can cause a problem. Like Drew mentioned, um, there's a lot of value in having a connected network where you can move up and down, up and down stream uh, from one reach to another. So we take this disconnected raster channel map and we create a connected polyline network from it. Um, so this would be a one dimensional line network, which we could attribute um, and relate reaches upstream and downstream of each other. Um, so here's a quick demonstration of some advantages of this really what we call hyper resolution. Um, well, resolution. <laughs> so here you can see the NHD on the screen in red. Um, you can see generally it follows where these washes are. But if we overlay the hyper resolution data, you can see it's much more precise in where it maps the streams. Um, it's the meanders a little better. And again, it maps these, these washes. Sorry, I keep saying streams. I'm used to getting this talk in the chest peak. <laughs> um, it maps them from bank to bank. Um, and this is really well suited for precision applications. And we can also detect, like I mentioned, channel width and depth directly from the DEM. Um, that has lots of fun implications in a, in a modeling environment. So another example, this time from the Chesapeake, um, I mentioned that this, this layer is discontinuous. So here you can see a few culverts and a bridge that are interrupting the channel network. Um, and we preserve those in this raster layer. But like I said, we make a connected polyline network. Um, and what's important about the raster layer is that we know the upstream end and the downstream end of where the channel is coming from and where it needs to go. So we don't need to breach or enforce the DEM ahead of time, which again, if you map streams using flow directions, you know that that's a, a huge component of the process. It's really com computationally intensive. Um, so this is a big advantage that we don't have to deal with that. Another advantage is that um, the stream initiation is not based on any thresholds. Um, so here's a stream. Um, that you can see in the hillshade, and in pink are some lines that are based on flow accumulation threshold of that 60 acres of drainage. Um, and you can see they sort of extend further past the start of where that channel actually is. Um, but with our direct detection method, um, it's it's inherently flexible across different geographies because it doesn't it doesn't rely on a prediction. It maps the depressions exactly where they are. If I bring that up, you can see that the green channel <clears throat> begins right there where you can see it in the hillshade. Um, and we've also mapped a ditch to the right here that was missed by flow accumulation. So with this novel method, um, we've sort of solved a lot of challenges and introduced new challenges. Um, so previous methods, as I've mentioned, focus heavily on conditioning DEMs, routing flow, predicting channel initiation, deriving appropriate thresholds. Um, so our approach solves these problems robustly. Um, and our new challenge is 
distinguishing which channel features we want to include on a map. So our approach, the, the channel features that get identified, um, they're not all streams or washes or, or what have you. Um, there's a lot of other things on the landscape that look very similar to channels. Um, so here on this image, again from the Chesapeake, you can see some agricultural ditches highlighted in blue. Um, so what we're focusing on now is classifying these different channel features um, and putting them into bins as to what they are. Is this a stream or is this a ditch or is this a uh, detention feature or a floodplain depression? Uh, because we don't want to just discard any of these features uh, because they each have their own unique research implications and, and they're valuable for different reasons. But they're not necessarily features that you would expect to see on like a blue line map. Um, so we want to give flexibility in that regard to how these different features can be handled. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Lewis, who will talk about our work in Pima County um, and where we hope to go with it. All right, thanks, David. Um, so yeah, we're basically starting up a pilot in Pima County um, in two areas of interest identified uh, with our partners at Pima County Flood Control um, south of Tucson, as you can see in the uh, image on the right there. And so our intention with this is not necessarily to replace um, existing data sets. We're trying to introduce novel um, new ways to look at hydrography data to complement and extend on the great work that's being done with NHD and other local hydrography data sets. Um, we're essentially piloting this methodology that we developed out in the Chesapeake to explore how it can be applied in arid and semi-arid landscapes. Through this process, um, we'll be, you know, communicating with stakeholders, um, working with the AJIC NHD work group, and seeking feedback on the types of features that can be extracted with this workflow and then attributing um, those features appropriately. And then hopefully, as if everything goes well, we can expand to a larger area uh, beyond these two um, boundaries shown on the right here. Next slide. Um, and I guess to wrap up this presentation, we just want to give you another look at um, some of our initial results you know, on the ground here particularly for this built-up environment. Um, this is a LIDAR hillshade. Next slide. And then again, the um, channel features extracted by the workflow, which, you know, as we go through this process, we haven't attributed, but through stakeholder, um, you know, interaction and feedback, we'll try to identify those features that would be most applicable and useful out here in Pima County. And next slide. And then here are those same hydro features um, overlaid over imagery. And next slide. And so, yeah, we're definitely very excited to um, share these methods out here. Um, this is all very new, and so it'll be interesting to see what kind of feedback we can get from local stakeholders and how this can complement existing workflows. And yeah, definitely reach out to us, and we're open to any questions. Thanks, David and Lewis. It's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> any questions in the chat at all, Quinn? No, there's no questions uh, still. Had a couple people drop off because we've gone over right. a bit on time, but uh, uh, all of you presenters did a great job. So yes, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank uh, all the presenters this afternoon and from the morning session for uh, doing a great job. 